Imagine there's an alien world far more advanced than us, looking down upon the Earth, observing all life forms in order to discover reason in their behaviors. Without a doubt, the human race would be described as a desert-making species. The only species that detach itself from their ecological and biological origin. Mainly due to collective stupidity and its short-term memory. And that's why we are in panic. Every well is drying up, every reservoir, and now the death toll is at 126 because of the heat. This reservoir has completely dried up. And the world is indisputably getting warmer. Heavy rain and flooding continue to bring misery to much of Western Europe. I think I'm going to stop rising until climate is treated like the emergency that it is because it's our future. And last year, scientists warned... This is a question of our survival. There's too much CO2. All of you, 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 you know, you're pollutants. The this is Thermopylae. This is Agincourt. This is the Battle of the Bulge. This is Dunkirk. This is 9-11. When you become president, are you going to stop global warming? It's not helpful to have terrified school children. I understand going, that. The world's going to end because the I world is not going to end. We're do. talking about human security. If we were going to war... You know, if our security was a threat, and our government said, look, mm. let's take our time about this. Let's wait till 2050, right? But it's not we war. Around the world, there are already climate refugees. Climate change is forcing people out of their countries, adding those migrants cannot be sent back. They are pushing climate policies that can and will do nothing ever. Global warming is a fraud. Climate deniers are dead wrong, dangerously, dangerously wrong. wrong. In a time where emotions overruled reason and the battle among opinions reigned supreme, I find hope in the words biologist Bill Mollison once said. Though the problems of the world are increasingly complex, the solutions remain embarrassingly simple. I have in 2016 a garden geerbt. Und ich habe schon immer gedacht, boah, es wäre toll, wenn man aus dem eigenen Garten leben könnte. Aber ich habe normal einen Zwölf-Stunden-Tag und habe gedacht, boah, wie kann ich da noch Garten machen? Und irgendwie habe ich in Gartenbüchern und so das Stichwort gelesen, Permakultur ist der Garten für Faule. Und dann habe ich gedacht, das hört sich gut für mich an. Und was ist das Vorteil letztendlich? In der Natur gibt es zum Beispiel nie unbedeckten Boden. Dann hat es den Vorteil, dass die Bodenorganismen viel besser leben darunter. Dann braucht man keinen Dünger zu streuen. Dann hält es die Feuchtigkeit besser. Das heißt, ich brauche hier gar nicht so viel zu gießen. Also geht es eigentlich um, dass äh, Boden so viel wie möglich bedeckt wird? Ja, genau. Das ist ganz wichtig. Weil wenn man wieder guckt, wie die Natur es macht, also wenn wir mal so ein naturbelassenes Waldstück zum Beispiel angucken, da ist ja auch kein blanker Boden. Wenn wir tief buddeln, haben wir den Boden, dann haben wir alte ähm, Mulchschicht von Blättern, wo man schon lange nicht mehr erkennt, dass es Blätter sind. Und dann kommen ja, Blätter, die man gerade noch so erkennen kann und dann kommen frische Blätter, die gefallen sind. Und das ja. versucht man hier nachzumachen. Ja. Ich habe schon immer mich gesund ernährt, das heißt, habe Bio-Sachen gekauft oder sowas und trotzdem hatte ich Magnesiummangel. habe ich gedacht, wie kann das denn sein? Und dann habe ich mal so die Zusammenhänge hier gelernt und was weiß ich, was ich da eben gelernt habe, ist, dass wenn ähm, irgendwie ein Dünger gestreut wird, das Magnesium gar nicht so aufgenommen werden kann für die Pflanzen. Die allermeisten Menschen wissen ja gar nicht, was das für eine Auswirkung hat, wie gesund der Boden ist auf die Lebensmittel. Und hier habe ich mal ein Refraktometer. Das gibt es für wenig Geld, damit wird die Dichte von Flüssigkeiten bestimmt. Und da kann man so ein bisschen gucken, wie nährstoffdicht ähm, ein Lebensmittel ist. Und ich habe jetzt hier mal eins von den ersten Tomaten aus meinem Garten. Und da macht man von der Flüssigkeit hier drauf, mache das zu, mhm. kann man probieren. Mhm. Dann kann man auch seine Geschmacksnerven eichen. Und dann guckt man hier durch und du erkennst Brickswert von 8. Ah ja. 
Und man sagt, ab sechs schmeckt eine Tomate nach Tomate. Okay, also das ist gut. So, und jetzt haben wir gekaufte Tomaten. Hier ist jetzt eine Bio-Tomate. Fünf. Und ich habe dann den Permakultur-Design-Kurs gemacht ähm, online. Und ich muss sagen, das hat wirklich meinen Blick auf die Umwelt sehr verändert. Seitdem haben wir auch fast überall an den Wasserkennels äh, Fässer stehen, um das Wasser aufzufangen. Und ich habe gesagt, das kann nicht mehr sein, dass wir Wasser einfach in die Kanalisation lassen, gerade wo alles so trocken ist. Es führt so eins zum anderen. Permakultur und Tiere. 2016 gingen bei uns die Milchkühe aus dem Stall, weil der Milchpreis so schlecht war. Und da ging es darum, was machen wir jetzt? Da sagte sie einmal zu mir, hast du dir überhaupt schon mal Gedanken gemacht, wie viel Geld du jeden Tag verlierst? Ich meine, das ist halt eben eine total uninteressante Geschichte. Wenn wenn ich irgendwo 29, 30 Cent Kosten pro Liter in der Produktion habe und soll noch 2, 23 Cent in der Auszahlung haben. Und bei der Menge, die wir auch hier gemolken haben, da kam schon einiges zusammen. Ich habe also einfach gegoogelt, Permakultur und Tiere und kam auf Ellen Savory. Und das habe ich mir angehört und habe gedacht, wow, wenn das stimmt, was der da sagt, das, das ist ja gigantisch. A simple thing we can all agree on, that if you have a problem, you need to address the cause of the problem. If you don't, you have zero hope of success. If we were to ask today in society, our media, our institutions, etc., what is causing global desertification and climate change, you would be told without any hesitation that it is being caused by livestock and it's being caused by coal and oil. Now, common sense. Livestock are going to be needed for centuries to produce food, milk, hide, whatever, leather. It's how we managed livestock that caused global desertification or led to it not the livestock. Coal and oil are resources with large carbon molecules. We're going to need them for centuries to produce many products. There's no way in the world a resource can cause a problem. This whole event is about soil health, yes. right? And, and what is the narrative? Well, the soil health is what provides food for the world. Farming has been very driven by chemical use, by fertilizers, by chemical fungicides. And the, uh, the show here is about trying to move that towards less destructive uh, management, trying to just approach this biological farming to see where we can get to. Ja schon, aber irgendwo fehlt mir das Wissen, was muss ich zum welchen Zeitpunkt machen. Ne? Dass für uns schon das Unnatürliche normal ist. Alan, what is the general feedback to the outside world of your uh, perspective? The reaction of ordinary people is just enormous. People see hope. I'm putting forward two paradigm shifting counterintuitive ideas. One is that only livestock now can save civilization as we know it. And no scientist has ever shown where I'm wrong, either my logic or the science that I cite. And the second new idea is that at the core of all human decision making is a very simple genetically embedded core decision making which is reductionist and that is what is causing the problem not our stupidity our ignorance or anything else uh, you've got to ask yourself why over 10,000 years couldn't somebody solve the problem of desertification 
The answer is we didn't know what was causing it. And now it's the same with climate change. Uh, I was uh, talking to one uh, fellow, uh, Professor Tear, Jim Tear, years ago, it was 35 years ago, in Texas, we were out on, on some land, and he made a strange statement. He, he turned to me and he said, Alan, either you are wrong, and we will not be able to dig a hole deep enough to put you in. And he said, or oh, you are right, and the world will not be able to build a monument high enough. And I said, it's not about me, Jim. It's not about us, it's about the future of humanity. And I said, what do you think? And he said, well, I'm sitting on the fence. Well, he died sitting on the fence. It's, it's time for people to either destroy what I'm saying politically, get me out of the way and move on, or listen to what I'm saying and let us all move on, because I believe uh, that this is a simple way forward. Ja, also in der Natur ist es ja so, dass die Herde über das Grasland ziehen würde und wir hätten Raubtiere, die die Herde zusammenhält. Was soll ich nehme mal an, wir hätten hier irgendein Raubtier, würde man halt sehen, die Kühe gehen alle zusammen und verteidigen sich. Und das haben wir ja nicht mehr in unserer Umwelt. Deswegen machen wir das mit dem Zaun und zweimal am Tag gehen die ein bisschen weiter. Das heißt, somit ahmen wir die Natur mit den Raubtieren nach. Und die Herde würde halt immer weiterziehen, weil das Land davor eben abgefressen ist und vollgeschissen ist und da bleiben die halt nicht, dann gehen sie weiter. Man muss ja auch sagen, man hat ja auch hier irgendwo mit dem niedergetretenen Gras den Effekt, dass der Boden bedeckt bleibt. Und dass das Wasser eigentlich nicht so schnell verdunstet. Das Schon alte Gras wächst, äh, das sterbt ab oder äh, ja, wird verkrappelt und genau. wird Kompost, sag mal. Das wird ja. Kompost oder Biomasse und düngt im Grunde genommen die Fläche. Komm, man sieht ja im Grunde genommen, da sind ja direkt schon die Mücken drin und die setzen ihre Eier da drin ab. Da wird der Mist, der wird quasi direkt jetzt umgesetzt. Der Effekt ist ja auch für die, den Rest der, der Tierwelt ist ja auch da. Ich meine, da, kommen, da haben die Vögel die Möglichkeit, da sich die Maden rauszuholen und alles Mögliche. Dadurch werden halt die Bodenorganismen noch gut versorgt. Und die sterben durch die Salze, die mit Kunstdünger drauf gestreut werden, durch Spritzmittel, die gespritzt werden. Sie sterben durch Hitze. Man sieht in der Regel viel planker Boden. Das sieht man jetzt hier nicht, weil alles schön gemulcht ist. Das heißt, wir versuchen hier, die Bodenorganismen florieren zu lassen, sozusagen. Ich meine, man muss sagen, wenn man so die Herde dann über Land ziehen hat, man braucht im Grunde genommen auch weniger Trockenreserven und äh, Winterfutter. Denn wir werden nach dem Motto schaffen, solange es geht, bleiben sie draußen. Also wenn die Trockenheit hier noch drei Wochen anhält oder so, da sind ganz viele viehhaltende Betriebe am Ende mit ihren Futterflächen. Wenn ich jetzt hier sehe, was wir im Futter stehen, obwohl es so trocken ist, das sind doch paradiesische Zustände. Ich glaube immer mehr, dass dieser Bibelsatz wenn man vom Baum der Erkenntnis ist, dann fliegt man halt raus aus dem Paradies. Ja, wenn wir einfach mit der Natur im Paradies leben, dann bleiben wir im Paradies. Und was können wir davon lernen? Dass jeder lernt, dass er mit seinem Einkaufen Entscheidungen trifft. So oft kommt es mir vor, als denken die Leute, ja, das ist ja eine Sache von den Landwirten oder so. Aber das stimmt ja nicht. Jeder, ja, nicht irgendwer weit weg, der umdenken muss, sondern jeder muss umdenken. Und dann kann man auch was ändern. I'm fascinated by the simplicity and at the same time its major positive impact for nature, health and climatic stability. Understanding the fusion between humans, animals and nature 
in an effort to stabilize the natural balance, which we might rock a bit too much. However, there are different future ideas laid out already. Next, scientist and two-time Pulitzer Prize winning author Edward O. Wilson. From small insects to big ideas and now a very big one, one made more urgent by the problems of climate change. Setting aside half the earth as natural habitat. My alarm went from yellow to red when I read the papers uh, authored by large numbers of scientists and how far off the goal the conservation organizations were. New technologies and globalization are not enemies of the city, they are its friends. The cities are the places where things are much easier, where people flock together. Humans save nature by not using it. We are midden in Amsterdam. Drie maanden terug hebben we dit pand uh, hebben we betrokken en hebben we eigenlijk onze uh, voedselproductie uh, PPU's ingezet. Uh, en daar produceren we eigenlijk uh, sla, tomaten en komkommers. Mm. En leveren we eigenlijk direct af um, aan de bedrijven die heel dicht bij ons in de buurt zitten. Dus heel weinig voetmijls. Waarom doe je dat binnen? Omdat we binnen geen last van de zon hebben. We willen eigenlijk in de stad produceren en op de manier als we binnen produceren, produceren wij veel meer per vierkante meter. Dus onze productie is veel hoger dan bijvoorbeeld een kas of buiten, uh, waarmee we eigenlijk geen last hebben van uh, een slecht voorjaar of een, uh, of een hele koude winter. Maar je zegt geen zon? Nee. Uh, je hebt echt zon nodig? Je hebt... Uh, niet helemaal. We kunnen met twee kleuren licht, rood en blauw, kan je eigenlijk het fotosyntheseproces in gang houden van de plant. Waardoor je al die andere kleuren eigenlijk niet nodig hebt en daardoor eigenlijk veel minder energie gebruikt. Dus helemaal aan de andere kant van de unit beginnen we met een uh, net geteamd zaadje eigenlijk. En dan binnen 12 dagen groeit hij van net geteamd zaadje groeit hij eigenlijk uit naar volwaardige slaapplant. En dan hier aan het einde van de unit wordt hij eruit gehaald en de oosten we. Dus, uh, we zijn hier begonnen met uh, sla, tomaat, komkommers en verschillende soorten kruiden. Uh, maar we hebben inmiddels ook bananen en, uh, en ananassen en dergelijke gedaan. En dat zou ook op zo'n manier gebruikt kunnen worden dat je er geen eindproduct van maakt. Maar dat je bijvoorbeeld een jonge bananenboom produceert in een unit en hem daarna eigenlijk in, het, uh, in de buitenlucht neerzet. Waardoor je een veel betere start hebt. Daar zou het ook voor gebruikt kunnen worden. En dat hebben we al meerdere malen uh, op die manier gedaan. Uh, maar op termijn zou je eigenlijk gewoon het hele ja, palet wat in de supermarkt ligt, zou je natuurlijk in de units kunnen, kunnen gaan produceren. Dus je creëert hier de natuur een beetje na? Ja, we, zijn, we lopen hier in een PPU, een Plant Production Unit, waar we eigenlijk alle omgevingsvariabelen die voor de plant belangrijk zijn, controleren en ook regelen. En dat we in een afgesloten ruimte zitten, kunnen we alle verschillende parameters, zoals licht, temperatuur, vocht, CO2, luchtsnelheid, kunnen we allemaal precies regelen. Waardoor de plant eigenlijk altijd de omgeving heeft die die, die, die het lekkers vindt op dat moment. En je, ik zie geen grond, hier zonder aarde? Of wat? Klopt, ja, we, we telen hier zonder aarde, we telen hier op, uh, op steenwolblokken. Uh, zo wordt dat uh, eigenlijk overal in grote kassen op dit moment uh, gedaan, al meerdere jaren op die manier, waardoor we geen aarde hoeven te gebruiken. En dit gedurende langere tijd kunnen gebruiken en het houdt het water vast op de manier die eigenlijk perfect is voor de, voor de plant. We dus zeggen wel eens dat in de aarde zitten zoveel voedingssupplementen, waar haal je die dan vandaan? Ja, die geven wij eigenlijk met het water mee. Met schoon water en daarna voegen wij de meststoffen toe aan het water. En dat water wordt naar de plant uh, gestuurd en wordt daar gegeven. En het overige water, wat niet gebruikt wordt door de plant, uh, komt eigenlijk weer terug in deze ruimte. En dan hergebruiken we weer 100%. En dus je werkt er ook niet met pesticiden? Nee, omdat wij uh, geen ziektes in onze ruimte hebben. Het zijn afgesloten ruimtes. En op die manier hoeven wij ook geen pesticiden uh, te gebruiken en die zou je hier ook niet zien. Het enige water wat wij gebruiken is het water wat in het product zit en wat weggaat. Dus een buitenteelt nemen heb je daar soms uh, tot 250 liter per kilogram voor nodig. Dus 250 liter water nodig om een kilogram van een product te produceren. Als je dat vergelijkt met onze manier van produceren hebben wij maar één liter nodig. En die ene liter is eigenlijk vergelijkbaar met die ene kilo die we produceren. Uh, en daar zit dus, dat is het water wat we eigenlijk verbruiken. Terwijl een buitenteelt uh, verdampt de plant ook en die wordt constant water gegeven. Maar dat water gaat eigenlijk de lucht in en kan niet meer teruggegeven worden. Dus dat is echt gewoon verbruik van water. Ja. 
laten we het een container noemen, zou je in de Sahara van Ethiopië kunnen neerzetten. En je zou mensen daar eigenlijk per direct kunnen voorzien van eten. Ja, exact. Ja, wij zouden dat dan niet in een container doen, dat is eigenlijk te klein, waar je eigenlijk dan naar moet gaan kijken. Oké, okay, hoeveel mensen wonen er in dat gebied? En ga je productie afpassen op uh, de mensen die daar wonen, zodat je niet gaat overproduceren. Dus je moet echt gewoon produceren voor de, ja, de mensen die daar zijn. En dan kan je eigenlijk van tevoren kan je dat berekenen hoeveel vierkante meter aan units we nodig hebben om die bevolking op een bepaalde manier uh, te voeden. Ja. En in, op allerlei plekken in de wereld eten mensen natuurlijk ook anders, dus daar moet je ook naar kijken. En dat kan heel makkelijk, omdat we van ja, we kunnen elke plant kunnen we, uh, kunnen we maken in onze, in onze ruimtes. Dus hiermee decentraliseren we eigenlijk de hele voedselproductie. Exact. Dus je maakt het echt lokaal en je kan de mensen ook erin betrekken. Uh, dus in plaats van dat we zakken met rijst gaan brengen, kunnen we ook uh, dit soort technologie bij hun neerzetten. Waardoor ze zelf verantwoordelijk worden voor hun, voor, hun voedsel, uh, voor hun voedselvoorziening. En ook gelijk een hele hoge standaard. Dus qua voedingswaarde en dergelijke kunnen we natuurlijk producten gaan maken waar hun heel veel aan hebben op dat moment. This is strange. We left the soil, the sound of nature, the moving sunset, all in an attempt to regulate our needs. Artificial food born in the matrix to serve efficiency and security. Not a bad idea. Strange though. Nach dem Dürresommer 2018 ist seit Jahresbeginn schon wieder viel zu wenig Regen gefallen. Wir haben auch keine Futtervorräte mehr aus dem Vorjahr, also ist alles, fast alles aufgebraucht. Wenn die Trockenheit dann so ewig anhält, da kann man irgendwann nichts mehr machen. Het is ontzettend ruig. Even helpt het nog mee, want ik kan een beetje water geven, maar oh, 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 oh. Heb je dat nooit meegemaakt? Nee. 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 Ook bij ons in het bos. Nou, de kind het van Heyhoed zien, ja. Al die ja. kapotte buim, ja. Bij het vissen van Heyhoed. Hoor fijn, ja. ja. Dit is gewoon onvoorstelbaar. Ja. En ik zeg al, ik heb hem gelukt dat ik hier nog water heb. Want anders was ik. Uh, was ik dan hadden die koeien allemaal weggenoten. Hmm. En dat is mijn lust en mijn leven hier in de natuur. Met, ik heb gelukkig hei, maar boah, er is nergens geen graas, geen sprietje graas gegroeid. In de zomer en het nooit wordt niks. Hmm. De besef op de achtergrond, wie is dan die boerigheid? Ja? Ja, ja. Zo, dat geveel, zo van oh jee, oh jee. Ze zitten tussen de industrie en de banken. Dus de, 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 de spuitindustrie, zeg maar, de, de chemische industrie, tussen de afnemer. Want dat krijg je allemaal op de beurs. Hè? De granen en, en alles gaat naar de beurs. Dat wordt verhandeld op de beurs. De boer krijgt natuurlijk maar een beetje ervan. En uh, de bank die hier hem die, die ganse leven in de nek. Ja? Hmm. Met een, een heite oom. Waar blijft mijn geld? Waar blijft mijn geld? Hmm. Dus die boeren, en vooral nou, die moeten toch onvoorstelbaar stress hebben. Hmm.
Jetzt sind wir im September, gab es jetzt noch keinen nennenswerten Regen und du hast dann keine Erträge. Aber du bist äh, Milchvieh? Ja, Milchproduzent, ja. Deine Kühe muss er essen, normalerweise essen die von Gras. Ja. Und wie geht das jetzt? Ja, ähm, also Gras ist in der Tat ein Riesenproblem. Normal machen wir vier Schnitte, das heißt eine Wiese, die wir haben, die können wir viermal ernten. In diesem Jahr haben wir sie einmal geerntet. Und um das auszugleichen, haben wir dann äh, grünes Getreide gemäht und in den Silo gefahren. Äh, was uns dann natürlich auf der anderen Seite wieder fehlt als Körner. Ne? Und wir kaufen zu. Wir kaufen viel Stroh zu hm. ähm, und auch Mais. Vor allem Nordeuropa, hä? der Verwüstung von das Ackerland. Ähm, sie, siehst du das hier auch? Die erleben wir ja ganz praktisch seit zwei Jahren. Wir haben Anfang September, die Aussaat wäre ja schon voll in Gange für bestimmte Früchte. Wir haben noch nichts gesät. Und damit ist eigentlich schon vorprogrammiert, dass das nächste Jahr nicht optimal laufen wird. Kann ja gar nicht, wenn ich nicht die optimalen äh, Saatzeitpunkte nehmen kann. Beziehungsweise ich nicht die Früchte anbauen kann aufgrund des Wetters. Und das kann man dieses Jahr nicht... Äh was, was bringt es, Körner in die Erde zu sehen, wenn kein Wasser da ist? Also das ist so, als ob man versucht, in der Wüste Getreide anzubauen. Nice to meet you, Marijn. Maggot. Maggot. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Uh, I was just curious, what, what are you growing here? We're growing our food here in the desert. Uh, to, we have tomatoes, cherry tomato, uh, mangoes, Swiss chard, uh, kale, kohlrabi, uh, palm, pomegranate, uh, bell pepper on the left. And, come, 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 I'd and, like to yeah. show you. <laughs> okay, come, okay, come. okay, okay. Welcome, man. And, and how, how, do you, how do you grow it? I mean... We grow it with, the, as you see, the taking care of our soil, uh -huh. to build the soil, because everyone thinks that the soil on the, on the desert, it is uh, dead soil. But it is not. It is a living soil, but it's a sleeping. So this all is a, it's sustainable? Yeah, yeah, yes, it's sustainable and uh, how we make it sustainable, this is a long story and I found uh, an innovative solution, but it's not easy to talk, it needs time, so why you don't come tomorrow that maybe we can uh, talk about this and uh, I, I show you uh, more things here. Yeah, I would love to, yeah, yeah. About the palms. And... Yeah. These are all different tomatoes. Different, different, different types of tomatoes. You have uh, uh, broccoli, pepper, chicory, pepperoni. Just to smell it. Mm. Oh yeah. Take one. Take one. And, uh, here. Yeah. Mm. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh. Not us, but maybe. How do you how do you irrigating it? How, where do you get the water from? From the well, I show you. 
the water from the sea and the water from the rain. Uh, we bump from the, from the well to the tank on the left, and then from the tank we use the irrigation, drip irrigation system. Oh, it's a little bit salty, huh? Why is your crops growing on salty water? Now you test it, and now you saw the, 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 the crop, okay? So miracles are happening here. It's not only the salinity of the water is one factor, there is different factors. So what kind of seed that you are using, the plant which is salinity tolerant, this is first uh, thing, like resilient, like the moringa and the, the other uh, green, uh, like the tomato, they can tolerate this salinity of the water. And uh, then we have uh, uh, the soil building with the, uh, a lot of nutrient to the, to the soil that help the plant to, to, to grow. And also you have the dough. And for example, this, this is uh, atriplex. This atriplex, it takes the salt from the water. Try, try it, this one. Try. Mm. It's salt that we use it to crash. Yeah. And, yeah, and we use salt. So you have oh. different plants that help other plants to minimize the salinity. And we have seed banks. The first generation coming from these seeds, they are adaptable and they can uh, more uh, salinity tolerant. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's really salty, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is salt. We use it as... And how's your community reacting on it? I took this model and I started to share this knowledge with my community. We have more than 10 uh, backyard Bedouin uh, women uh, food gardens. Plus, we have 12 farmers that they have their own camp, like the model of Habiba. Totally, we are 75 farmers. So you're mixing the jobs yeah. and tourism, uh, yeah. uh, so uh, agriculture. Yeah, yeah. It says we can work for tourists. You have money good, but you can make for him that. And after tourists, nothing. Yes, we eat from this, not problem. Mm -hmm. This is nice. This is good. For, we'll make this first. You have money, we can make like that. Mm -hmm. And after we can eat a little bit, uh, maybe one year, two years, it's, it's, it's help it. For some, you understand, we like this women there who make tomato, we make anything. We have seven farmers that we make every Sunday, collect the vegetables from, from us, to put it inside a green box and deliver to the hub. Yeah. So there is no shop in between. It's going directly, directly from the farm. From farm to door. We need to feed seven billion people in this world. Imagine that we all do the same what you are doing here. Uh, we are uh, consuming more than what we need and then this is what creates in our uh, mind that wow we are facing hunger facing hunger there is places that they are facing hunger but not because of the that they don't have food but because having the degradation on their lands the Egyptian civilization, how it started, started beside the Nile, and then Egypt was uh, the food basket for the uh, Roman Empire. Unfortunately, nowadays, we import a big part of our food, and this is something which uh, I, I don't like, I don't want, because we are uh, uh, destroying our, our environment, and, uh, you know, things coming from Australia or coming from state. So I'm inviting whoever can to uh, cultivate part of his uh, food. If he is not capable to do, so he go to partner with a farmer. If he is not capable to do that, at least he go to support a farmer by buying his food, not from the shop, not from the supermarket, but going to the farmers mm. to give them back the dignity and the importance and to be thankful for every farmer on this, in, on this earth. right we are not dying from hunger rather from mismanaging our food supplies in arable land as long the farmer is able to irrigate the water to the garden he can grow food green the garden and feed his local community and even in a dry and dusty desert 
Is there throughout our geological history a correlation between the expansion of the deserts and climatic changes? Well, uh, from a paleoclimate perspective, I think there is absolutely a connection between desertification and climate. But are the deserts driving the climate or is the climate driving the deserts? I would say surely the, the climate is driving the deserts. We see strong connections between changes in, in monsoonal activity and the viability of agriculture in some of these uh, marginal areas. The southern margin of uh, West Africa, where the northern parts of their landscape are limited by the expansion of the Sahara Desert. And that's strictly a monsoonal uh, boundary, and that's strictly related to the strength of the uh, intertropical convergence zone and its migration. So what is scientifically providing the energy for our climate? It is the sun which provides the energy for our climate. CO2 is a secondary effect. So it, it traps the outgoing infrared radiation and then re-radiates it back to Earth and slows, what we would say is slows the cooling of the oceans. It's mainly about energy in the oceans anyway. Why wouldn't we be more concerned about the sun? Because that can be modulated uh, naturally through cloudiness. And if we change the cloudiness of the planet by 1%, that energy change is equal to all the attribute, attributed change by CO2 that from our industrialization. When we look at the paleoclimates, which we have very good records of, never do we see a correlation with CO2. CO2 can be very high and we're going into an ice age. It can be very low and, and uh, we're in the middle of a, an interglacial or, wow. or hothouse earth. It doesn't seem in the geological record to have any impact on climate. I believe we do have environmental challenges and we're ignoring them. We're focusing on CO2 as if we, if, as if we solve the CO2 problem, we solve all these other environmental problems. But we've got all sorts of environmental degradation, uh, the oceans in particular, uh, eutrophication. Uh, agriculture is not all that benign. We can improve on agriculture, I believe, with more research on the use of uh, pesticides and, uh, and nutrients. So there's lots that we can do to the environment, but let's look at the real problems and real solutions. What can we fix? but we're not going to fix CO2. You see what? Nature was, and you're trying to copy from the nature. Nature was exists before us, millions of years. So why we have to invent the wheel and to put all the pesticide and to, to find the difficult solution? I went to the easy solution, which is rebuild your soil, treat your plants, see your environment, try to mimic the uh, uh, nature. And this is now what I'm going to leave behind me. It's food security for generations to come. I don't want to leave for them money. I want to leave for them a rich soil, that from this rich soil, they will be the richest persons on the world. Ja, ik hoorde van Megget dat jij eh, met nog wat anderen bezig bent met het vergroenen van de woestijn hier in de Sinaï. Ja, klopt. Dat klinkt, klinkt nogal heel ambitieus. We hebben een vraag gekregen vanuit de generaal van Egypte over wat we konden bedenken voor Bardi Lake. Eh, omdat de ecologie daar eh, kapot begint te gaan, omdat het heel erg zout is en heel erg eh, ondiep. En dat is een meer? Wow. Dat is een meer in het, in het noorden van, van de Sinaï. 
En uh, toen we daar naar aan het kijken waren, uh, kwamen we eigenlijk uh, tot de conclusie dat als wij de Sini zelf vergroenen, wij uh, regen genereren voor een heel groot gebied en een betere waterconditie voor een nog groter gebied. Huh? Um, waardoor we hebben gezegd, daar gaan we voor, want dan kan heel Noord-Afrika wellicht groen worden. Heel Noord-Afrika? Nee, de locatie van de Sini, in combinatie met de sedimenten die in het meer liggen, kunnen zo'n groot potentieel betekenen voor de wereld. Maar door, doordat je zegt, we reactiveren het meer, zeg je dan dat het hier ooit groen is geweest, in die woestijn waar we nu zitten? Ja, onze theorie is dat dat zo is geweest, ja. 7000 jaar geleden geloven wij dat het groen was en dat het toen kapot is gegaan door menselijk handelen. Nou ja, kijk, als je... Je hebt satellietbeelden. Dit is de Sini en hier is dat meer. En je ziet hier al het hart hè, met, zijn, met zijn aderen wat rivierbeddingen zijn geweest. En aan de hand van zo'n foto zijn we ook met een x-ray gaan kijken naar het gebied. Ja, en dan zie je gewoon hoe het als een soort hart ooit geklopt heeft. En dat willen we weer aanzetten. Ik kan me bijna niet voorstellen dat dit ooit groen is geweest. Ja, en toch. Die rivierbeddingen betekenen gewoon dat daar ecologie is geweest, natuur is geweest, lopend, stromend water. Dus dit is gewoon allemaal levend geweest. Hoe kan het dan dat het nu woestijn is? Ja, het is hetzelfde als wat de mens nu doet. Um, onze theorie is dat 7000 jaar geleden de mens hier agricultuur heeft gedaan, zoals wij dat vandaag de dag ook doen. Monocultuur, uh, begrazing van vee. En ze hebben gewoon meer van het land genomen dan dat het land te geven had. Waardoor met regenval er van die mudslides zijn ontstaan. En met erosie is al dat sediment meegespoeld naar de lagere delta van het vruchtbaar het uh, materiaal eigenlijk. Het vrucht... Je ziet het vandaag ook op het nieuws, hè, dat er van die, van, die, van die hele modderstromen naar bergen afkomen. Wall of mud and debris tore through the Arizona desert today. Deadly mudslides tonight in California. Mudslides and floods killed at least 379 people in Brazil. The eight people are confirmed dead. At least 18 others still missing this morning. We're telling them that that foundation right there, it had a house on it. That house is now over there. Several people have died. Dozens are still missing. The mudslides power down hillsides north of Rio. They say the ground simply might have become unstable after recent rains. En dat is hier ook gebeurd 7000 jaar geleden. In natuurlijk meerdere momenten. Totdat de ecologie dus eigenlijk ja, in collaps is geraakt. Ah ja. Dus die, de, de, de vruchtbare grond is eigenlijk weggespoeld naar onder. En, en waar is dat nu? Daar is de delta in gegaan. En in de delta heb je een meer wat uh, precies op de rand met de zee ligt. Dus eigenlijk een lagoon. En uh, dat meer was 20 tot 40 meter diep vroeger. En dat is nu anderhalve meter diep. Huh. Dus daar is dat geërodeerde materiaal is daar ingespoeld. Met ook zand en zout zit erin, et, et cetera. Maar daar zit het organisch materiaal zit daar ook nog steeds in. Ah ja. Dus het organisch materiaal bagger je uit en leg je feitelijk weer terug op de plek hier waar het vandaan kwam. En het organisch materiaal kun je in eerste instantie gaan gebruiken ook samen met hellefites. Dat zijn speciaal planten die tegen zout kunnen en die dus ook zout uit de bodem halen. Maar je ziet hier in het gebied al dat op gronden waar zout aanwezig is, men in staat is om met de sedimenten die er zijn beplanting te hebben, waar ze van kunnen eten. En we hebben het nu over in de hogere gebieden, um, plantjes te hebben, bomen te hebben, die kunnen gaan wortelen en die kunnen gaan zorgen dat A, wat je daar neerlegt, niet meer kan eroderen, dus dat het kan goed kan blijven liggen, maar ook dat je het vocht gaat opvangen, eigenlijk natuurlijke waterproductie, dat, dat de, de bomen, zullen we maar zeggen, de, hun, hun bladeren het vocht gaan opvangen uit de lucht in die hogere luchtlagen. Ah. Dus eigenlijk wat we continu doen, 
is analyseren hoe een natuurlijk systeem werkt en dat proberen te kickstarten. Want wat het leven nodig heeft om zichzelf te herstellen. Als het een woestijn is zie je eigenlijk dat de wind heel hard over het land oppervlak waait. Geen vocht meer krijgt omdat er geen ecologie is. En al het vocht gaat verloren over die berg. Maar eigenlijk zien we dus dat op het moment als die ecologie hersteld is, dat het vocht wat er verdampt op zee dan weer voldoende vocht krijgt vanuit het land en weer neerslaat tot regen. Op het moment dat er ecologie is en het water kan verdampen, die, ver die energie die daarvoor nodig is, wordt niet meer omgezet tot hitte. Uh -huh. Dus dat land wordt minder heet, dus de wind gaat minder hard blazen. En doordat je dan dus nog steeds die toevoeging nu krijgt van die verdamping, neemt die concentratie sneller toe. Uh -huh. Tot het moment dat het gaat condenseren. En op het moment dat het gaat condenseren, implodeert die lucht. En gaat die eigenlijk op een hogere luchtlaag uh, weer verdampt vocht van de zee aanvoeren. Maar iedereen weet, als het water condenseert, geeft die warmte af aan de lucht. Dus zie je eerst altijd dat wolken eerst in verticale richting zich gaan ontwikkelen. Uh -huh. Totdat dat druppeltje zwaar genoeg wordt. En niet meer voldoende van de thermiek heeft om omhoog te gaan, maar gaat vallen. Uh -huh. Maar op het moment dat het korreltje valt... Draait hij de windrichting om? Uh -huh. Hier zie je uiteindelijk uh, de scene hier liggen. Dat land hit op, dus je krijgt die thermiek, dus je krijgt een lager drukgebied. Dus hij zuigt de verdampte vocht van de zee over die scene. Er is geen ecologie die voldoende vocht kan toevoegen voor regen. Dus die wind waait heel hard en ramt hier die rode zee in. Uh -huh. En wat ik zag, dat de Indische Oceaanlucht Mesopotamië inging, ofwel Irak en Saudi en noem maar op. Als we hier die windrichting omdraaien door het herstel van die ecologie, dan draai je het hele systeem om. Als we hier dit hele kleine stukje stoppen, krijgt hij niet meer al dat vocht dat hij wegzoog uit die Middellandse Zee, die Rode Zee. Maar door het Corlioli-effect, dat de aarde ronddraait, wist ik dat de oude Indische Oceaanlucht eigenlijk deze kant op wil. En wat je daarmee ziet, is dat het eigenlijk een acupunctuurpunt is van deze regio. En misschien wel van deze uh, hele wereld. Uh -huh. um, waarbij je als je dat weersysteem herstelt door de ecologie te herstellen... je het globale en regionale weerpatroon totaal omdraait. Maar in hoeverre steel je dan eigenlijk water van, van, van andere landen? Je ziet hier een kaart van alle geregistreerde typhoons en cyclones in deze regio. Hier ligt de Sini. Uh, en hier zie je eigenlijk dat in het huidige systeem... Um, zie je dat het vocht wat hier geïnjecteerd wordt in de watercyclus van de Indische Oceaan eigenlijk heel veel slecht weersystemen veroorzaakt. En op het moment dat je dit vergroent, zullen hier dus ook drastisch het aantal typhoons en cyclones stoppen. Daarnaast, als deze wind hier weer op gang komt, kan dit feuneffect wat we eigenlijk in Noord-China zien ook niet meer op gang komen via Aleppo. Dus door één klein plekje in de wereld te vergroenen, dat het een soort hotspot, klimatologische hotspot is als we dat gaan herstellen. Wauw. So we are able to reset nature back to a certain time. To practically give humanity a second chance. Another example is the array of technologies, often referred to collectively as geoengineering, that potentially could help reverse the warming effects of global climate change. Lasers now could one day manipulate rain and lightning. We physicists are firing trillion watt lasers into the sky to actually precipitate rain clouds and actually bring down lightning bolts. Some people have grown tired of waiting for Mother Nature to bring relief and have decided to try and take matters into their own hands. This is Craig's job, firing chemicals into the clouds in a controversial attempt to modify the weather. You could actually spray sulfuric acid in the stratosphere, 20 kilometers over our head, and use that to stop the planet warming up. There are currently more than 47 countries, more than 150 cloud seeding programs going on as we speak. That will permit man to determine the world's cloud layer, and ultimately to control the weather, and he who controls the weather will control the world. Saving the climate and controlling the world. Very bad synonyms. Andreas, ik lees hier über cloud seeding, solar radiation management, weather manipulation. Ik meine, wie ernst kan ik das alles nemen? 
Cloud Seeding wird gemacht, um, um zum Beispiel Hagelschauer zu vermeiden, also der, der Wolken zu impfen, in denen, oder Gewitterwolken, vor allem in denen sich große Hagelkörner bilden könnten. Wird in Europa auch gemacht. Es wird in den äh, USA gemacht, in Israel. Es wird zum Teil auch gemacht, um, um Niederschläge äh, zu beeinflussen, also es mehr regnen zu lassen, gerade in Wüstenstaaten. Es würde, würde in China um die Olympiade gemacht, in Peking, um da die, 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 das, das Wetter einfach zu verbessern. Es ist sehr fraglich, ob das was bringt. Also für das Klima bringt das sowieso nichts. Das ist viel zu klein, viel zu lokal. Das ist nach einem Tag wieder alles weg. Dann ist, es, äh, ist die Wolke eben abgeregnet oder auch nicht. Da wird angedacht, dass man eben auch global die Bewölkung, die Wolkenfläche auf dem Planeten vergrößert. Wolken sind hell, reflektieren sehr viel Sonnenlicht und könnten damit die, die Erwärmung des Planeten Erde, die wir jetzt sehen, etwas verlangsamen, abschwächen. Wir nehmen einfach viel mehr einstrahlende Sonnenstrahlung gleich zurück ins Weltall reflektiert wird. Und was ist das für eine Stau? Was ist das für eine Substanz? Gibt es Ideen, also ein Vulkan ist, sind schwefelhaltige Sachen, schwefelhaltiger Staub, der ist besonders gut, weil er wieder Wasserdampf anzieht. Da bildet sich im Schwefelsäure was, kleine Tröpfchen. Und dann kann man mit wenig Staub viele große Tröpfchen schaffen und damit eine große, weiße, spiegelnde Fläche, die eben die Strahlung dann abwirbt. Es gibt auch Wissenschaftler, die sagen, man kann das Aluminiumteilchen nehmen oder das oder Kalk in CO2 ist ja immer noch da. Das hat eine Lebensdauer von vielen hundert, einigen tausend Jahren. Und das heißt, so lange müsste man sicherstellen, dass man immer den Staub nachliefert oder immer die Wolken nachimpft. Ich greife noch nicht so viel ein in, 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 der, in, in, in der Biologie. Ja. Ähm, lass die Natur einfach die Natur. Ja, das kann man machen. Die Natur wird das irgendwann regeln. Also auch, wir hatten auf der Erde schon viele Situationen, in denen viel mehr CO2 in der Atmosphäre war als heute. Das heißt, die Natur kann damit klarkommen. Das ist kein Problem. Und die räumt irgendwann das CO2 auch wieder weg. Und so hat der, die, der Planet Erde das über die Jahrmilliarden immer hingekriegt. Das, das ist so ein selbstregulierendes Thermostat. Hm. Geht leider sehr langsam. Und so lange wollen wir jetzt als Menschen im Moment nicht warten. Die Hauptfrage ist natürlich, wen kontrolliert letztendlich was, wo und wie viel mhm. da passiert in unserer Atmosphäre und Richtig. wem gehört das Klima? Ja, das Klima ist ein Allgemeingut, denke ich. Also es müsste demokratisch verwaltet werden. Wir haben jetzt keine Weltdemokratie, die entscheiden kann. Wenn man jetzt in dieses Climate Engineering, also Strahlungsmanagement vor allen Dingen reingehen würde und sagt, irgendjemand ist jetzt ein Mensch, der entscheidet, wie warm, wie kalt wird es, dann sind wir sofort alle unzufrieden, weil wir denken, Mensch, warum hat das jetzt heute hier so doll geregnet? Oder der Landwirt denkt, warum hat das heute nicht geregnet? Mist, da ist irgendjemand schuld. Und sobald wir wissen, da ist jemand schuld, dann schlagen wir uns wieder die Köpfe ein. Dann Und ich glaube, das wäre eine Welt, in der ich nicht gerne leben möchte. Und in der ich äh, wahrscheinlich die Menschheit insgesamt unglücklicher wäre. Since human memory, we have the urge to control our lives and environment. And we should. However, the differences between care, control and manipulation are razor thin. Climate computer models became the premise of policies against the so-called global crisis. It's a risky business where the future has been determined by spreadsheets rather than observations. And he who controls the model, controls the outcome. In das Alte Testament steht der Garten auf Eden beschrieben als ein Platz, wo der Balance der Dinge das Paradies bildet. Was will man uns da eigentlich erzählen? Zunächst mal ist ja der Schöpfungsbericht ähm, ähm, handelt von dem Schöpfer, der Himmel und Erde, die Pflanzen, die Tiere und die Menschen geschaffen hat. 
Und ähm, das sagt uns eben auch, dass in allem, was lebt, eben dieser Schöpfer auch da ist. Und dass man eben ähm, ein großes Miteinander auch hat. Also es heißt, seid fruchtbar und mehret euch, machet euch die Erde untertan. Aber dieses Untertan machen bedeutet eben nicht äh, äh, ausbeuten und alles und Hauptsache wir, sondern leben und leben lassen. Also es gibt von, von äh, Albert Schweitzer ein schönes ethisches Prinzip, das sagt, ich bin Leben, was leben will, inmitten von Leben, was auch leben will. So, das ist eigentlich damit auch gemeint mit dem, mit, dem, mit dem Paradies. Leben und leben lassen, dass es eben allen gut geht. Nicht nur uns Menschen, sondern auch äh, den Tieren und Pflanzen. Gerade dadurch, dass ich in Nordnorwegen gelebt habe, ja. ähm, wir hatten da wirklich Gletscher in den Bergen. Wir haben wirklich gesehen, wie es zurückgegangen ist. Und wir haben auch gesehen, was das für Schäden in der Natur hinterlassen hat. Gerade das ist auch wichtig, dass man davon erzählt. Die große Frage ist für mich natürlich, der Garten of Eden hat auch sein eigenes Leben. Jo. Und der macht das, was er will. Manchmal wird er kälter, manchmal wird er wärmer. Ähm, muss man der Garten of Eden stopfen? Oder wo, wo ist der Balance? Das ist schwer, oder? Das ist, Weil man äh, kann sagen, ja, der Gletscher zieht zurück. Das ist die Natur. Ähm, wir müssen wieder dahin kommen, dass wir auch sagen, ähm, man muss auch der Natur den Spielraum lassen und sie auch leben lassen und nicht bei allem gleich ähm, heftigst mit technischen Mitteln eingreifen, sondern auch mal gucken, kann sich die äh, Natur also vielleicht auch selber helfen. This combination of climate change, which is the first real existential threat man has faced, combined with uh, the fourth industrial revolution, offers huge challenges, but also incredible opportunities. And I think our, our task as leaders is to get people from the position where they tend to think that the challenges are dominant, to a position where they start to accept that the opportunities could be dominant. Uh, because it is not a technological problem, we can solve it. Frankly, it's not even a financial problem, uh, we can solve that too. It's a problem of integrating everything at a global level. Hmm. It's a problem of integrating everything at a global level. scientists warn us, we have a global emergency. CO2, CO2. If we do not take action, hurricanes. Number one way worse threat. than the we ice on Greenland is melting. Ice melting at record levels. The polar bear is in danger. The devastation, the destruction is impacting frontline communities. By putting more CO2 into the atmosphere at a rate that is too fast for human uh -oh. beings. If we don't take action, The world is going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. As much of the natural world is on the horizon. We are here because our parents trashed the planet. 
Are polar bears in danger? At the moment, no, they are not. In fact, polar bears are thriving. We don't know how much humans are influencing climate and whether it's going to dominate in the 21st century. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood. I think this is a great sign. This generation, our kids, are leading the way. Oh, shit. Are these going to save the planet? Maybe. In a thousand years. Good gravy. Good morning, San Francisco. It is a chilly start to our day, much colder compared to yesterday morning, and a gorgeous start. I'm extremely skeptic in accepting the catastrophic predictions on global warming, whereby only man-made CO2 gets to blame. Because when we give into it, every step we made can and will be criminalized or taxed. However, I do believe in, a, in environmental disruption, causing land degradation, desertification, droughts, floods, loss of biodiversity. Do you think it's fair enough to make that distinction? Not at all. Why? You're separating the climate. You're making two things. That's Cartesian thinking, that's Descartes. That is like, I am one thing, I'm an individual, it is other. That mindset, that thinking that climate is other is the source of the problem. It's the cause, it is not the cure. And I agree with you that if you catastrophize something, it is not the right signal to send to people. It doesn't engage, it doesn't get them involved. You know, we should not approach this from a point of view of guilt or shame or blame. That doesn't work at all, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. We should approach it from the point of view of what you brought up, which is your love of nature, your love of animals, your love of gardening, trees, plants, you know, bees, flowers, you know, everything. That's where we should be coming from. You wrote a book, 100 Solutions, How to Deal with Climate Change. Most interesting chapter for me was about regenerative agriculture. However, lots of people see it as a problem because you need to have lots of land for it and say we should leave nature and set it aside as such. I had a friend once who said, when you have a choice, take both. The fact, <laughs> the fact is, you're making a distinction between nature and, and farmland and grassland. Okay, don't. In other words, if you manage farmland and grassland properly, it is nature. Okay. You're not killing it. You're not harming it. You're actually it's evolving and getting richer and better and more diverse. The grasslands are, the farmlands are, because we know how to farm and to have animals in such a way that the land becomes more natural, there's more birds, there's more worms, there's more organism, organisms in the soil, there's more insects, there's more life, and there's more water in the soil that means there's more water in the streams, there's more, more water for the fish, there's cleaner water going into the oceans. I mean, this is turning it back to nature. And I think it's a good point, though, because if you look at the Native Americans when we got here, the image that was put out, and still is to this day, that the Indians, the Native Americans, were not very smart and you know they're running around just grabbing food wherever they could that is so not true they were they they cultivated the wilderness in other words they farmed wilderness they we had fires this year okay in california and last year and last year i mean huge fire. California is burning. Thousands have been forced to flee their homes in California where a wind-driven brush fire has erupted. Wreaking havoc and devastating communities. 
It's desperate conditions like these that have now taken the lives of at least 44 people across the state. We've seen hundreds of acres consumed. And quickly burned several thousand structures in its path. The fast-moving flames quickly forced officials to order the entire community of 27,000 people to evacuate yesterday. Basically, the whole town's on fire right now. Has turned the town of Paradise into a living nightmare. The Native Americans would make sure that when the branches broke or something, that they would take them away. They would smoke the tree every year. They spaced them out. The animals had grass in between. They would burn. They would use fire ecology sometimes to burn the grasses, which, you know, in the Buffalo Commons, the grasses in the Buffalo Commons were 10 feet tall, the perennial tall grass prairies, you know, huge herds of buffalo. Native Americans co-evolved with the grasslands and so on. So what they did is make ecosystems more productive, more diverse, more life-giving, more food-giving. Food giving. But in the case of California with oaks, they didn't burn down. If there was a fire, oh, the grass burned, the trees stayed. And now all the trees are burning because there's two to 400 oak trees per acre because nobody cultivated that, you know, the, that wild forest. What do you think in which extent we are a part of nature? How do I need to see it? Well, I mean, we are <clears throat> inextricably uh, a, a part of nature. There's no way we can be apart from it. I think, you know, one of the greatest problems, if you will, is that we think we're an I instead of a we. And we doesn't mean just, you know, people. It means trees, birds, plants, water, everything, you know, this is the big we. And I think that is an understanding that, again, indigenous people had innately. It's um, the pathway to that is connection, you know, connection. Mm. And that means uh, feeling, listening, seeing, listening to other people, too, just as important, but, you know, so that we actually begin to feel at home. It's really about coming home. It's about coming home. That's right. It's about coming home. But the point though is, who decides what and where my home is? This, this was an oyster farm. This farm? was a farm just like any other farm within this zone of the seashore. This was a concrete building here built in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a pier going out into the ocean, I mean, out into the bay here where the boats landed. And the oysters were brought up and the processing happened inside this building. We also had, um, in part of this building was the hatchery operation where we worked with the microscopic larvae and we produced the seed. So we had staff in charge of the seed production, staff in charge of the processing, um, and, and, peop and, and also the same place is probably about here. The front, of, the front of the building was the retail. So the people, 50,000 visitors a year, would drive in, park all over here, and enjoy picking up their oysters and clams. They'd, they'd share them on the beach over here on picnic tables. There were five homes over here where the farm workers lived and those, those homes dated back to the 1940s and 50s. Wow. Um, and uh, so this has been a lively part of this community um, for almost 100 years. 
I just remember busloads of people coming even from Oregon, uh, farmers coming from Oregon that were talking about the oyster farming business, came down here and we showed them the whole process. My brothers, uh, there were three of them that worked uh, collectively to put these hatcheries together and they'd never seen such a thing. So it was, uh, it was pretty amazing. It was California's largest oyster farm. And it was uh, completely loved. This was one of the best examples of a working landscape with cooperative conservation. Natural resources were thriving beautifully um, with the farm. But it was so beautiful that the extremists said, well, if we remove the farm, we can rename it wilderness. It's this holy grail, the, the, the highest level of protection is wilderness, but we have to kick out the farm. We were farming in the middle of farmland. Um, it has always been farmland. When the National Park Service came in and purchased the uh, property from the landowners, because this is the first unit of the National Park Service ever created out of private land. Mm -hmm. It was because of an agreement that these people could continue their way of life into the future, and they would agree to sell to the government and make it a national seashore. 50 years later, People don't like the agreements. They will use natural resources, they'll use wildlife, they'll use endangered species, and it, they actually just pull from a box because if one of those arguments starts to fall short and they can't make those arguments um, productively, they'll just change their argument. Hmm. The only thing, the only common thread is they want you out. And it's and it's a it's frankly it's fake to say that oh because of your impacts to this particular species, it's it was somehow harmful to to that species. See that little harbor seal? Oh yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, when it in fact had no, had no impact at all on, the, on that species, mm. none. The National Academy of Sciences. The Marine Mammal Commission looked at a broad suite of natural resources and our impacts and said there's really no reason we can't coexist. They just shifted the argument. Oh, well, it's this other species. Our legal defense um, for the work that we did to try to save the farm, the legal expenses were north of $7 million. And we could have never paid for it. These were big, wonderful law firms that saw what was going on, they said, we have never seen a federal agency so out of control. Would you like us to help you? And so this was all pro bono. Hmm. We didn't pay for any of the legal defense because we couldn't have. Wow. I'll never forget um, a conversation that we had in a meeting with upper level uh, Department of Interior staff. And when we said, well, isn't this a public decision? And the response by the interior solicitor was, no, we bought it. It's ours now. We make the decision. We knew the decision was coming. We knew the date by which the decision had to be made. And we had not heard, and we had not heard, and we had not heard. So we were all, we were all ready for the call, trying to, and we were very hopeful, right? Yeah, but we never did give up hope. We never did give up hope. Um, when all of our employees, when uh, the phone rang here in the building that we'd just be on the edge of right now, um, my daughter answered. My daughter Bridget answered, and she says, "Dad, it's Secretary Salazar, the Secretary of the Interior." So, a President Cabinet member called the, the farm and, and asked for me. And I was on the phone for about 30 seconds. And I said, yes, yes. And I could see my daughter, and who was here? Sean was here. There was, I was there, we were all Everybody there. was here, and they were all in tears. They could tell just by my face the message that I was getting. It's, and, and it does, uh, for, I'm sure for both Kevin and myself, you walk out here, and it is, it's heartbreaking, you know, to see it just gone.
I spent 30 years as an appraiser of real property for the California Department of Transportation. I was a district branch chief and I testified in court on land value and land use. And at around 2002, uh, I started noticing that there was a planning revolution going on in the Bay Area that I literally couldn't tell for sure what people could do with their property, even when I knew what the zoning was. And I would go to the planning departments and try and pin them down on what could someone do with their property, with their land. They literally wouldn't give me an answer. And I started seeing that really this wasn't just in San Francisco, that planning had changed. And around that same time, I was elected uh, to do citizen oversight on a huge redevelopment project in uh, Santa Rosa, California, where I owned some property. And as I looked into the redevelopment project there, I saw that the plans for it were fraudulent. The justification for it was fraudulent. And at first I thought maybe it was a mistake, you know, that the government had made an error. And uh, so I drew it to the attention of the government and they immediately tried to get me off of that committee. They, uh, they went around to, to other people who were on the committee and said, don't listen to her. And uh, the more I found out, the more I realized that I needed to start a citizens group. And from that, uh, we tried to get something on the ballot so that people could actually vote to see if they wanted this plan, which was actually going to destroy a huge portion of the city. And, uh, and also redirect their property taxes for 35 to 40 years. So it's a huge project, enormous. Because of that, I started to research uh, land use um, in a political sense. And as I looked deeper, found United Nations Agenda 21, Sustainable Development. Published by the United Nations. 300 pages, 40 chapters because it's just a green mass. It's an inventory and control plan. It's all about data collection, surveillance, data sharing. It's a management and control plan of populations. And it is designed to literally leave you no place to hide. The meeting, first proposed to the United Nations by Sweden and approved by the General Assembly in 1968, attracted worldwide attention. In four short years, the topic of the human environment had gone from the back pages of newspapers to make headlines on page one. General Assembly of the United Nations asked the Brutland Commission if they could come up with a plan to implement sustainable development worldwide. It approved an EarthWatch program to measure and identify environmental problems on a worldwide scale, as well as an action plan to protect man and his habitat from further degradation. And sustainable development was defined as development that meets the needs of the present while uh, protecting the needs of the future generations. So it was assumed that, yes, everything we're doing now does uh, in fact, threaten the ability of future generations to meet their needs. This in itself represented a very significant step forward. International laws to compensate victims of those forms of pollution that cross national boundaries. All the countries of the world agree to it, so 178 countries plus the Vatican. It's a non-binding agreement but our nations made it binding on us. Every country has a local Agenda 21 plan. But how can I see it? What is the structure? The two parts of Agenda 21, which is the urban part, smart growth, and the rural part, the Wildlands Project. And the Wildlands Project has basically wild carnivores coming back into the wild. Uh, corridors, buffer zones. Hurting people off the lands, literally, uh, that 50% of all the land in every single state needs to be uh, rewilded back to the way it was uh, when Christopher Columbus stepped foot here. We must convert at least 50% of the land area to wilderness, off limits to human beings. 
It's about removing jurisdictional boundaries because, well, animals don't know where the boundaries are. So if you're going to have a free world for the animals, then you need to remove all borders. You know, the plan is to completely erase the 50 states, to move people into huge megacities that eclipse our constitution. The cities themselves right now are giving themselves the power to make international treaties and agreements. Who is really benefiting in getting us out of the rural areas, mm -hmm. uh, getting us into these desert cities? Well, if you move people out of the rural and suburban areas and into the dense city centers, you can more easily manage and control them because they're collected in a concentrated area. This is, these are called the three pillars of Agenda 21. This is uh, social equity, the environment or ecology, and the economy. And where they are balanced in the center, that's supposedly sustainable. Social equity, that's really about balancing um, not just your local uh, economy, so you're going to maybe take care of your local people. That's actually removing borders so that uh, you, can, you can share your economic well-being with people who are less economically uh, um, sustainable. The point of Agenda 21 is to level the economies of the world so that they are all equal. And that means bringing down the developed nations and bringing up the lesser developed nations. So that then when you have the nations all equalized like that, if you have more than one toilet in your house, you've got too much. You're using too much. So that justifies bringing you into the city, into a small unit where you can be, of course, managed. It's a corporate totalitarian plan so that they can move their goods without any restrictions on borders, so that there's no boundaries, no border restrictions, no regulations, so all laws are harmonized, and then you can literally have no, uh, no stops on corporation, then they can lower wages, they can move populations when they need uh, to move workers, it's bigger than any other plan that's ever been proposed in the entire world. Of course, the Nazis tried, but they did not have the technological capability. And neither did the Soviets, and neither did, uh, of course, the communist Chinese. But the difference is that now they do. In order to make a plan like that work, you need terror, and you need uh, technology to spread the information everywhere. So 9-11, that justifies total full surveillance. And climate change justifies, you know, getting everybody out of their cars where they have individual mobility and getting them out of the rural areas where they use too much water, too much energy. I actually think that they want to create the new Garden of Eden that would be off limits to most human beings. Uh, when your food can be grown essentially in a parking garage downtown, you know, where they're with hydroponics and, and other systems, uh, there won't be any need to go into the rural areas. It's not a stupid thought that humans will undergo the same management as the artificial plant in the closed units. Collected regulated, efficient, and obedient. And those were off the beaten track. Red warning, you are in a no-go zone. Please turn around. You are under violations of the law. You entered a non-human area. Human rights do not apply here. We are forced to disable your data chip. Five, four, three, two, one. This is frightening. 
when politics are no longer downstream from culture and using climate change as a tool to erase farms, cultures, communities and states. It's becoming a challenge and almost a courageous act these days, looking through the political mist into the real world with the real challenges, where often solutions are against all odds, but simply forgotten through the test of time. Alan, back in England you were claiming that livestock is the only tool to combat desertification and land degradation, which is quite a wild idea. Uh, how did you come across that idea? Uh, with great difficulty. <laughs> right. And I started in, in areas like this. These were wonderful areas when we set them aside uh, as future national parks. So when I was a young man, this was beautiful. Now it's, as you can see, virtual desert. And I was studying this problem, totally unable to correct this with the wildlife alone, no matter what we did. You see that, yeah, you're in a national park and it's some of the worst habitat destruction for humans and wildlife that we have in this country. When the soil is bare like this, most of the rain runs off, getting to the ocean, and or it evaporates out of the soil, increasing atmospheric humidity, both of which aren't good for climate stability. But, uh... This might be a stupid question, but what are the animals eating? God knows. Hmm. They're eating twigs, they're pulling trees down, uh, they're picking up litter, dead plant litter. There is no grass to graze. Yeah, this is not what a national park should look like. You can see, as far as you can see, you're seeing two, three kilometers down there. The whole bank is bare and everywhere. It's just eroding and collapsing. Look at the big trees, hundreds of years old, that have collapsed and fallen into the river. And many others have washed down, gone. There are no reed beds, there are no bushbuck left. Uh, all the birds and the mammals and everything associated with the reeds and the, and the riverine growth have all gone. And that's the best of management that the Western world knows how. We have to change management. When I first bought this property in the 1970s, there was lots of that bare ground and the farmer ran a hundred head of cattle. There were no elephants, no buffalo on, on this land. They were fenced off. This is the last remaining bare spots. Listen to it. Do you hear that hollow sound? You shouldn't hear that when you trap soil. That is very unhealthy. Now, every gardener knows you don't have to be a scientist that if you want plants to grow on this, you're going to have to break that. Livestock with their hooves, if you change their behavior so that their hoof action breaks us. Now you've got a tool that can do that year after year and get the grass growing, as you're going to see, all over this property. Grass is now beginning to grow because we used the livestock to break that surface and get the plants to start growing. The cattle coming in for the night. Always we are with the cake, because once you leave them without the attended, the lions, we have got the predators here, they will eat the, uh, the, these cows. Oh, yeah. Yes. And, and you, can, you can defend yourself against lions? Uh, lions, they run away from people. Oh, yeah? Yes. Oh, really? Yes. Oh. 
<laughs> when we are going to live here, all this uh, soil will be fertile. It will be all fertilized with cow dung and urine, this place. After two weeks, we moved the cross from here, we moved to that side again, two weeks again. Uh -huh. Then uh, after there, then we move again down that side. Yeah. Where we are going to stay again two weeks. Ciao. See you. Have a good sleep. Watch for the lions. So what we're doing here is showing that cattle can break that, and they can do it every year, and grass can start growing. And now water is coming out of the atmosphere back into the soil. Carbon is coming out of the atmosphere back into the soil. Mm. And we could be doing that over most of the world. What is science? People talk glibly about science. What is science? People coming out of a university with a master's degree or a PhD, you take them into the field and they, they literally don't believe anything unless there's a peer-reviewed paper. It's the only thing they accept. And you say to them, but let's observe, let's think, let's discuss. They don't do it. It's just, is it in a peer-reviewed paper or not? That's their view of science. I think it's pathetic. Gone into universities as bright young people, they come out of them brain dead, not even knowing what science means. They think it means peer-reviewed papers, etc. No, that's academia. And if a paper is peer-reviewed, it means everybody thought the same, therefore they approved it. An unintended consequence is that when new knowledge emerges, new scientific insights, they can never, ever be peer-reviewed. So we're blocking all new advances in science that are big advances. If you look at the breakthroughs in science, almost always they don't come from the center of that profession. They come from the fringe. People see it differently. The finest candle makers in the world couldn't even think of electric lights. They don't come from within, they often come from outside the brakes. We're going to kill ourselves because of stupidity. You are a trainer here at the Alan Savory Institute, right? What can you change with that holistic approach in communities? The grading land has been troubling communities, especially they don't have forage for their livestock, water shortages and so on. And now when we introduce the idea of holistic management, at first people are resisting, but those who took the idea, then they noticed that the grass was actually growing and also in some places even rivers started flowing again. What was the context of your problem? We, I mean, we could not plan any, anything on this, I mean, on this sand. It was just so barren. Mm. What did you do? We, we, had, we had to, to have our crows in the field so that we can have a better yield. This is your crow? Yeah, and here we bore my lungs. My lungs were not over worse, man. 
Sawa paka na bivi galu vara mashuva. Akare mashuva nenda kuringa kuti i kugua bakanja. Before we started, it was so bad that... What, what do you mean bad? How, do, how does bad look? You know, they, they would get, I mean, a very little, I mean, a yield, very little, I mean, food. Mm. Yeah, but now, you know, I mean, when they started doing this, yeah, I think it's okay. Can you sell stuff from... from if, what if, you, if you do like this, then, then you, can, you, can, you can sell. So, with the community, you have an income? Yeah, 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 we do. So in Atitina Sassis, the Kanjenga Escabella party, Nabantoves, Kangeluki, Villas, and Abantuaba, Lesby Pants. So Sassi, Fagan, Lesby, Tatas, the Lesby, Ama Oranges, Esa Watla, and Yelayo, Angazala, Sia Shea, Song Kingati. This is inspiring. Despite the drought, communities at the margins of society can restore a backyard desert into a food garden, build a small local economy and inspire the next village. I think it's all about giving the local farmer the right knowledge and responsibilities instead of governmental consensus-based subsidies. Uh, drought is a cycle, and uh, drought being a cycle normally comes like after every five years or ten years. But currently we are complaining of dry season and uh, blaming the drought. Dry season is just about management. If you fail to manage your pasture, in the moment it rains, you can have the same amount of rain, but because of poor management, the response of the land will really not be effective the way it should be. So we end up having less pasture, not because of the drought, but because of the way we've managed our pasture. The pasture have disappeared, and so the rain cycle is no longer effective. So we end up saying, oh, we had a bad year, we had a drought. Well, it's not a drought, it's just a dry season, but you've mismanaged your resources. That means less pasture, that means you link it to a drought. Is it due to monocultures? Well, an aspect of monoculture could definitely be there, but also you know, the way uh, we don't give plants a recovery period. Recovery means the plants really have had enough time for it to grow, to seed, to reach its maturity before it's graced. Mm. And that's one thing that people fail to understand. Cattle go everywhere on this property as because there is no other tool to produce the habitat for humans and wildlife. The, the leaves on the trees are dying and falling off. It, the tree is removing its own leaves. So when the rains come after eight months of no rain, the light can reach the buds and the tree can grow more buds. No grass can remove its own leaf. The grasses co-evolved with millions and millions of large animals that help the grass by removing the leaf. So its sun could reach the growth points. Now, if we didn't have the wildlife, all this patch would be dead by now. So what is keeping this going is the elephants the waterbuck, the giraffe, the bushbuck, the impala, the kudu, the game moving through it. So there's enough wildlife moving through this that it's keeping a lot of the grass alive. The big environmental organizations are very much part of the problem now, causing desertification and so on, because they believe the only way to keep these grasslands healthy is to burn that. Burning is rapid oxidation. It's still a chemical process and not a biological. So we are burning over one billion hectares 
of grasslands every year in Africa alone, causing enormous damage to society, to uh, environment, to everything. So by using um, more livestock, we still have the problem of methane, right? Methane breaks down in living, healthy soils. That's where it breaks down. And the, if you take North America, where a lot of that thinking is coming from, there are today, I believe, 11 species of large mammals in North America. Prior to humans arriving there and killing off most of the wildlife and replacing their role with fire, there were 40 more species of large mammals. Mm. That's what the soils developed with. Now, all of those large mammals virtually would have been giving off methane. Why wasn't it a problem? Because healthy soil breaks it down. We had no option but to use livestock and many more millions of them to stop the land degradation. It's completely opposite of what we are Correct. hearing. Now that and is very offensive to professional egos, tragically. Hmm. Institutions can unintentionally become stupid. As Alan says, you can put thousands of brilliant people in a group, but because of the policies, fear of offending, political correctness, prestige, geopolitics, funding interest, they make compromises and do stupid things. The real change is not coming from institutions or governments. It can only come from the bottom, from within the communities. That's where we are. Hurting people off the land, literally. This holy grail, the, the, the highest level of protection is wilderness, but we have to pick out the farm. We have to pick out the farm. Into the dense city centers, you can more easily manage and control them. It makes no sense to spread seeds on concrete and then well, expect anything account. to come from that. Like we need, need to wait for the rain. Resources. If you manage the farmland and grassland properly, it is nature. We need to wait for the rain, a thing we have no control over. We're growing over. our food here in the desert. But first, after a year of ich bin leben, was leben will, in Mitten von leben, was auch leben will. Climate change has been polling. So generally speaking, you can believe the observations, and you don't have to believe the theories. Let's look at the real problems and real solutions. What can we fix? But we're not going to fix CO2. A lot of policymakers, farmers, students, politicians, are coming here for a course. What is their most common reaction? The commonest reaction from all of them was, oh my God, this is just common sense. <laughs>